Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Once again, I have this wonderful privilege EWTN gives me to join with you to hear a story of conversion. They're always powerful. They come from so many different angles. When we hear different stories of uh, men and women and their backgrounds, we recognize that similar fingerprint of the Holy Spirit on people's lives, but they all touch us differently and, uh, and we listen both to hear their story as well as to listen to how the Lord's guiding us. And so I pray that this is a, a, a touching story for your journey of faith. Our guest tonight is Emily Stimson Chapman. And I always enjoy having uh, fellow authors on the program because we can also, if we can't have time to talk about her books, she's the writer of the most recent. It's called The Catholic Table, Finding Joy Where Food and Faith meet uh, along with a couple with a couple other books we might talk about later but first of all Emily welcome oh it's great to be here Marcus. welcome to the journey home it's good to have you here uh, you're what we call a f uh, former nominal Catholic and evangelical right yes. bit of, okay yes. well we'll get to that uh, but it's good to have you in the program and like I mentioned uh, you have a website also maybe tell them what your website is I do it's uh, the Catholic table dot com good so. Title of the book. Okay, good. So they can, they can go there and check out your books and maybe more about your story. Right? Yes. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to get out of the way, give you the table, and let's give you the Catholic table and let you go all the way back and start us on the journey. All right. Well, I was born uh, at a time when there was not a lot of good catechesis going on in the church. Uh, <laughs> I will, I'm very comfortable with my age. I'm 42, so I was born in 1975. And uh, my parents were. It was Good. a confusing time. It was time a very yeah. confusing time. Uh, there were still a lot of changes happening in the church. People were still trying to understand what had happened with the Second Vatican Council. Oh. And a lot of things that my parents had been told growing up were true, then they were told were not true. So my parents were very confused about yeah. what the church taught. Uh, a lot of chaos had surrounded their really coming of age. So I went to a Catholic school. You know, they, they knew that that was important because they had gone to Catholic schools. But they hadn't grown up talking about faith in the home. Faith was what you talked about at school with sister mm -hmm. or what you talked about, at, you know, this what the priest talked about on Sunday. It wasn't something you necessarily talked about. Uh, so they sent me to a Catholic school and we had uh, some interesting catechesis <laughs> at the time. Uh, things were very backwards. We had, I made my first communion two years before I made my first confession, just to give you an idea of how normally you make your first confession and then yeah. you make your first communion. But our school thought that you know sin didn't really exist. There was no need uh, for that confession yeah. thing. So we'll just tack that on at some point. We had a priest who danced down the aisle in tights once. What? You know, yeah, he did, Father Ted. God bless his heart. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm glad you didn't give his, his last name. No, so I, don't, I don't remember yeah. his last name. Yeah, but. Uh, I was a little girl. So, th uh, so it was a very confusing time to be growing up Catholic. We weren't given good catechesis. My parents went to church. They tried their best, but they didn't know how to talk to us about the faith. Um, so I just... And that's hard if you're, if you're a sincere Catholic parent that wants to pass on the truth mm -hmm. to your child, but it's changing all around you, and you don't know if what you're going to say is going to be the same thing that Father says the next week. It just paralyzes you in a bit. It's right, a, and they hadn't been given a good example of how to talk about the faith or how to talk about you know loving the Lord. So they just thought it was happening at school, and it was not happening at school. Now, was it the same thing happening at school that the teachers were hesitant to say w what it was because they didn't know if something was going to change, or they loved the changes? I think they loved the changes. Okay. I think they really loved the changes. I don't actually remember learning much about the okay. faith at school. I remember making stoles and banners and candles and things like that. Like but, yeah, like but that. I never was given the faith. I was never actually given the faith. I received my sacraments, but I wasn't evangelized. I wasn't catechized. The one thing you do remember are the tights, though. I do remember the I mean, tights. <laughs> it's really hard to forget that. It's like scarred into my brain. I mean, the reason I mention that is you want things, seeds of future spiritual yeah. development to come out of your childhood, and you remember the tights. I remember well, the tights, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, we all remember the tights. It's, it's just one of those traumatic experiences that bonded everyone who was at the parish at the time. So I went off to college at pretty much a good Catholic girl in the sense that I was... My parents did a good job of raising us to have a lot of natural virtues. 
So I was disciplined. I was obedient. I was chaste. You know, I was, I wanted to be good. I was a good Catholic girl. But I didn't know why I was a good Catholic girl. I didn't know <laughs> why I should be obedient. I didn't know why I should be chaste. I didn't know why it was wrong to do those things. I just knew that good Catholic girls didn't do those things. And none of my friends had done them either. I'd actually had a very, my teachers have talked about it in the years since, we had a very well-behaved class of <laughs> young women. Uh, so I was surrounded was by Catholic people. Catholic women's school? Uh, I ended up going to a public high school. So oh. I went to a Catholic grade school and then a public high school. But most of my friends were very smart, very motivated young women who were focused on getting to college. And that was, that's what I was surrounded by, people who were all on their best behavior so they could get to college. But any of your, I don't mean to interrupt with oh, any okay. of your Catholic friend, your girlfriends mm -hmm. in this intelligent group, any of them sensing any vocations? No, none. No, it, there was no talk ever among any of us about faith in the Lord. It was just a very, uh, okay. it was cultural yeah. in many ways. We were all badly catechized. We were all um, not evangelized. It was a very bleak time in the church. It was you know, primarily the yeah, 1980s, yeah. When, and, before and, the and, renewal of catechesis had started happening in the, the 90s. And the teachers of your Catholic schools were not even encouraging that anymore. No. Yeah, okay, no. so there you were, going to college. So and, maybe if I'd gone to the Catholic high school, I would have gotten a little, I would have gotten something oh, more, but at the public high school, I wasn't right. getting anything. Okay. So I went to college and suddenly, I was surrounded by people who were not being very good. So my roommates, my friends were making decisions that I had been told were wrong and that I believed were wrong, but again, I didn't know why. So I started questioning, why, why was I taught that you're not supposed to have sex outside of marriage? Why was I taught that you're not supposed to you know, smoke? And you, you know, why can't you use weed? What's wrong with these things? And I wasn't doing any of them, but I was, have you ever seen the, room, the movie A Room with the View? Really, with the young man's always drawing question marks and he draws a question mark on the back of the picture. I was doing that all over my notebooks. It was a continual why. I was drawing question marks, drawing question marks. And as God would have it, I met a very cute evangelical boy. Uh, it was 1995. He had the soccer, floppy soccer haircut and he was blonde and blue eyed. And if you did not know this, it's, it's actually a proven fact cute evangelical boys and bad catechesis. <laughs> it is a fast route outside of the church. So, but he was wonderful. He was a very intelligent young man and he knew I was asking a lot of questions. And he gave me Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, mm -hmm. along with a couple of other evangelical books. And I am a very, uh, I respond strongly to truth and to reason. And so reading C.S. Lewis's arguments about Jesus were extremely convincing to me. So the whole Lord, you know, either Jesus is Lord, he's a liar, he's a lunatic. One of the three has to be true. We can't be, you know, all three together. So I looked at some Buddhist stuff, I looked at some atheist stuff, but I kept coming back to C.S. Lewis and his arguments for Christ. And when I was 19, I gave my life to Jesus. And I can remember kneeling down in my dorm room and being like, all right, Lord, I give you this, I love you, I'm not sure what this is gonna mean. I was really worried it was gonna mean I was gonna have to uh, not wear stylish clothes anymore. Like, <laughs> that was my, like that was my big sacrifice for the Lord, was if it meant I had to be frumpy, I was going to be frumpy for him. Because my only experience with evangelicals before this friend were some people who had gone to a Bible missionary college in my hometown, and I just didn't know what it yeah. meant to be yeah, a Christian. It's more on the fundamentalist side. Much yeah. more on the fundamentalist yeah. side. So uh, Todd was brilliant, gave me lots of things to read, and I responded to that, and I was growing in faith, but I still was sometimes going to Mass. I was going to an evangelical church, but I was going to Mass, I was going back and forth. Um, the problem was I, had, I didn't even know what questions to ask yeah. about Catholicism. So Todd's argument was, well, it's all made up. It's not what's in the Bible. It's all these add-ons. This is the religion of men. You know, it's much simpler than that. It's about loving Jesus and serving Jesus. And I was like, okay, sure. You know, yeah. It didn't, it never had occurred to me, well, where did the Bible come from? <laughs> like yeah. who copied it and preserved it and interpreted all those years? I didn't know what questions to ask. Uh, now, Todd was involved with a group of evangelicals that uh, are very prominent in the nation's capital. They 
some people refer to them as the fellowship. Some people refer to them as the Christian mafia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they were they were founded by a number of people. Uh, Chuck Colson, um, Colson was involved at the founding. Mm -hmm. Doug Coe was the person who really ran it during those years. Uh, it's wonderful men who right. loved Jesus, and they were very focused on reaching out to two types of people. One were the nation's power brokers and power brokers around the world, so people who were very influential. They wanted to meet them and help them to know Christ. The other were young people who seemed like they would become leaders someday. They wanted to help these people come to love the Lord and really think about servant leadership and what it meant to lead as a Christian. And Todd had gotten connected with that group, and then through Todd, I was connected with them. And I went to DC after I graduated from college, lived in a house run by them. I worked on Capitol Hill for a while, and then I left Capitol Hill and just did full-time missions work, actually, with the fellowship. So I wow. helped run a retreat house with them. Um, I helped, I cooked, I cleaned. Everything I know about cooking, I learned through the fellowship. So, so by this time, you're a committed evangelical committed. Christian. Yes. Non-denominational. Non-denominational. Which means that a couple things happened in the process, whether it seems to me whether you were aware of it happening or not. One was, were you thinking that any of this had to do with your baptism? No. 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 So in other words, you have a disconnect there with your yeah. sacramental upbringing. Also, it, it really doesn't matter whether you're involved with any particular church mm -hmm. or not, because now you've got Jesus. With the fellowship, it didn't even matter if you went to church. It was just Jesus. Right. So it was a very stripped down form of Christianity. The whole point was, don't think about doctrine. Doctrine is divisive. Doctrine, you know, doctrine pits us against each other. Just, just, just be with Jesus, build small, intensive friendships with people and have them hold you accountable and work on growing, you know, in your love of the yeah. Lord through that. So what it emphasized, like mere Christianity, was mm -hmm. good. Yes. Oh, and it was very good. And yeah. I always say I am so grateful right. for the six years that I spent, you know, involved with the fellowship. I grew to know Jesus better and love Jesus better, and I wanted to serve him. I mean, I was still yeah. the same girl who wanted to be good, the same <laughs> girl who wanted to be the good Catholic girl. I was going to be good for Jesus. I wanted, and I was also really blessed. Um, several older women in the community had befriended me and discipled me. You know, they intentionally yeah. worked with me on what some of my issues were and my struggles and how I could love other people better and taught me how to <clears throat> look at myself and see myself, you know, that uh, self-awareness. I learned a lot of self-awareness through those women and I came to see areas where I was, <coughs> not, Excuse me. Oh, where I was not being as loving as I should, areas that I needed to grow and also just how much the Lord loved me. And mm -hmm. I was always so focused on being the extremely competent overachiever. You know, I had to be the best at everything. I had to I had to always be proving my worth. And it was with them that I first started to just rest in Jesus and see how much he loved me. And I'm assuming a great love for scripture. And a great love for scripture. My the New Testament. I never read the Old Testament much because I couldn't understand it. I was yeah. just very confusing. Uh, but I read the New Testament right. every night. And that self-examination mm -hmm. is usually from an evangelical standpoint, looking at it through the lenses of New Testament. Yes. You know, exactly. how you saw yourself the way St. Paul wanted us to see ourselves mm -hmm. in the light of Christ. Right. And yeah. the whole idea of St. Paul where he would talk about, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name oh, and if you right. take it to the community. So there was that great focus on just holding each other accountable and helping each other walk in the Lord and grow in Christian maturity. And I appreciated that a great deal. Mm -hmm. But there were also some problems along the way, um, and I should mention this now because we'll get into it later. This whole time, so I was 19 years old, I gave my life to Jesus. Mm -hmm. At the same time as I gave my life to Jesus, I was starving myself to death. I had uh, begun a Anorex I was an anorexic. Wow. So wow. a diet had gone out of control and I discovered that I could control my life by controlling what went into my body. So a lot of my struggles with the sin I saw around me, struggles and questions about what does it mean to be a woman, you know, how do I reconcile this, you know, my my mind, which is a strong mind, and my opinions, which are stronger than my mind, uh, with the other notions of femininity that people are talking mm -hmm. about. So throughout that time that I was with the fellowship, I was also struggling with food and trying to eat because I knew God wanted me to eat. But at the same time, that very Protestant view of the fallen human person where you're oh. a dung heap covered in snow, 
it was hard for me to understand like why the body mattered. I saw the body as bad. I saw mm. my body as the enemy. I saw it as something that had to be controlled. I mm. saw food as something that had to be feared. So it was almost a, a little bipolar in terms of I knew Jesus mm. loved me, but I couldn't really receive that love. And so that was going on through this whole time that I'm wow. in college, working on Capitol Hill, then doing missionary work with the fellowship. Um, and I was getting better in fits and starts along the way, but there's that real tension there that whole time. Um, also, a, a, a lot sorry. of us don't understand yeah. you know, what a person caught in that syndrome goes through. When you look in a mirror, do you always see yourself as heavy no matter what you are? We don't understand that, mm -hmm. my point is, you're also probably very isolated in what you're going through because nobody around you understood what you were going through. Well, they didn't understand because to you, to to them, you look perfectly thin. <laughs> so why are you? Why are you not eating? You can actually gain ten pounds and you can eat. <laughs> but it, it, one, yes, you always see yourself as as heavy when you're trapped in that mindset. Yeah. But it's uh, what I realized one day. I had stepped on the scale and it was the lowest number it had ever been, and I was really excited for a minute. Then there was this little, little little voice at the back of my head that said, how low do you want this number to go? And my first thought was zero. And that freaked out even me. I was like, whoa, <laughs> where did that come from? And I realized I was trying to erase myself. I, 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 it's this, I've often wondered whether it's not just that you see yourself as heavy, but yeah, you... You don't like you. You don't like you. You see yourself as worthless. You want to stop to exist. You just want to just rub, oh, rub yeah. the body away. Just yeah. rub it all away. Disappear. The smaller, I, I thought if I could just make myself so small, you know, that would be a way of controlling the opinions. That would be a way of controlling the personality. Uh, that would be a way of controlling everything. So there was this ongoing tension between my love for Jesus and my desire to please Jesus and this real self-hatred in the prison of anorexia. Uh, so this went on for about six years. Hmm. Towards the end of those six years, some questions started popping up in my head. The first thing that bothered me was the number of pro-abortion politicians who were in the fellowship. Hmm. There were several prominent Democratic senators who were very adamantly pro-abortion. Was there, the, had the fellowship had a position on this? No, and that was what bothered me. They wouldn't talk about it. Because I was oh. thinking, well, we're trying to hold people accountable. Surely, like, not killing babies or not being pro-killing babies is one of those things we should be holding people accountable Had you on. jettisoned your Catholicism by this point? Um, that was the second thing. I've, I had jettisoned Catholicism, but I still liked going to Mass. Okay. So I would sometimes not go to church. Sometimes I would go to the Protestant services. And sometimes I would go to So mass. it really didn't matter in a, in a sense. You like the art of the, or the, the nostalgia or whatever, but your pro-life-ish, how'd that come about? Well, I was, I was working for conservative politicians. Okay. Right. So I'd always been pro-life. I had never, okay. I'd always, you know, the sort of Christian teachings on chastity, Christian teachings on life, that was right. very basic for me. It was just one of those, the sun comes up in the East, you are not for supporting okay. abortion. I didn't, I couldn't reconcile, you know, how that could not be the case. So I had raised it with some of my friends and they're like, oh, we don't talk about those issues. And I was like, well, why don't we talk about those issues? And they're like, oh, you know, that's doctrine, it gets divisive, we just really want to focus on Jesus. And it's like, but Jesus said, if you love him, you will obey his commandments. <clears throat> and that whole, thou shalt not murder, seems like that would be one of the commandments he wants us to obey. And they didn't want to go there. They didn't mm -hmm. want to talk about that. That It was divisive. They just wanted to bring Jesus yeah. to these people and love them. And I'm like, well, at some point, it's not loving them to not challenge them on you know, <laughs> politics that are, are dangerous and against the value of human life. So I was struggling on that count with the fellowship. Uh, then there was the issue of the mass. I had for four years not gone to any Catholic services, any Catholic masses at all. I had gone to Protestant services. I would not, you know, just little home churches, things like that. But I missed I missed the liturgy of the body. I missed bringing my body into prayer, the kneeling, the standing, the sitting, that rhythm of worship with the body, which I didn't have a language for saying that at the time. I was wondering, you, 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 there was something missing. You, you there was put... something missing and I couldn't put my finger on it. I just kind of thought Protestants didn't know how to pray. I was like, they're really good <laughs> at the spontaneous prayer, but when it comes to church, you just go to church and you sing some songs and you sit down and you listen to a good homily. I was like, that's a lecture series. That's not, you know, you're not <laughs> worshiping the Lord. So that deep sense, <clears throat> that deep sense of liturgy that had been put into me as a child, 
you know, you can take the girl out of the church, but you can't take the church out of the girl. I really missed the Catholic Mass. Um, I didn't understand what the Catholic Mass was. I didn't understand what the Eucharist was. I just knew I missed it. And then one night I was at uh, like a Bible study and one of the women who had been discipling me, discipling me brought up, she goes, well, I think maybe next week we should, you know, have Holy Communion at, during our study. And I was like, you can't have Holy Communion during your study. What are you talking about? And she was like, well, of course we can. And she was trying to explain. And again, I didn't have the language to explain why I thought that was wrong, but I just knew a bunch of ordinary people sitting around their living room couldn't just make the Eucharist appear. <laughs> I was like, what are you, I don't understand how this is possible. So I was wrestling with these issues internally. Uh, and by this point, I'd left doing the missionary work. I was still, you know, all my friends were in the fellowship. That's who I spent my time with. And I'd gone to work at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. And I was there and they hired, uh, they hired Rob Corzine, who you know. Right. He is the, ex now he's the executive vice president of Scott Hans, the St. Paul Center. Right. Uh, but at that time, he was my assistant. So he was brought in to kind of help me help Ed Meese, who we were both working for at the time. And Rob was really Catholic. Rob was a convert himself. He had converted <laughs> from being a Baptist. And I had never met anyone like him before because he was obviously a Christian. I mean, he talked about Jesus. He loved Jesus. But he was also into bishops and liturgical vestments. And I was like, why is any of this necessary? And I did my whole fellowship line on him. I'm like, oh, you know, Jesus just wants us to love him. And he wants us to serve him. And all that extra stuff is add-ons. And Rob, who really knew his stuff because he converted from being a Baptist, started challenging me on those things. And again, when I had left the church six years earlier, I didn't know what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. I had never been given the Catholic faith. I left, I mean, of course I left because there was nothing there what, in terms of what I had been given. So Rob started talking to me about Catholicism and I'm thinking, I never heard this stuff growing up. Like, why didn't anyone explain this to me? It was a whole different way of even thinking about the church. And Rob, will, he, he still likes to joke that he would talk to me one day about something, like the church's teachings on contraception. And because I'm a redhead and I like to argue back, I would just argue with him and explain why, oh, that's so silly, that's so outdated. You know, this is such a, you don't have to be against contraception. But then when I would leave, I would actually think about what he had to say because there was no argument for me to win. <laughs> and I was like, oh, actually, that makes a lot of sense. And I would change my mind, but never tell him that I had changed my mind. <laughs> Until maybe a month later, he would say something. I'd be like, oh, I know I agree with you on that now. And he'd be like, what? Could you at least tell me when I win an <laughs> argument? <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> at that point, Rob realized, okay, I think Emily is ready to start thinking seriously about Catholicism. And he gave me... Uh, G.K. Chesterton book to start with, The Poet and the Lunatic, which was one of G.K. Chesterton's fiction, works of fiction. But he knew that I was very susceptible to the poetic and the beautiful. And he thought if he gave me a Chesterton book that really captured my imagination, I would want to read more G.K. Chesterton and that he could give me things that were a little more meaty. So that worked. I loved the G.K. Chesterton book. Uh, the next book he gave me was the sequel to A Severe Mercy. As a Protestant, I had read Sheldon Van Auken's conversion story, which talks about his time at Oxford and his relationship with his wife and how C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. brought them to Christianity. Very popular book with evangelicals mm -hmm. at the time. It's a beautiful, tragic love right. story. So what right. young woman wouldn't be, you know, captain? I loved that book. But I never knew that Sheldon Van Auken became Catholic. And so when I'm reading uh, the continuation to A Severe Mercy, I'm discovering this. I'm like, oh, this is someone who was really smart and really loved Jesus and knew C.S. Lewis. Wait, someone who knew C.S. Lewis and had talked with him became Catholic. I don't understand this. So the next thing Rob did was gave me, I think he gave me a Frank Sheed book. And I was reading that over Thanksgiving break. So a month before, Rob had needed to go to All Saints Mass and leave a conference that we had. And I was like, oh, you're so silly. You don't have to go. Holy days of obligation. You're just following all these man-made rules. Over the next <coughs> month I was reading, by December 8th, which is the next Holy Day of Obligation of the Catholic Church, you know, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, I had gone to confession and I was attending daily Mass. It was the most easy, it was the easiest. <laughs> there was no angst. There was no, 
stress. It was like, oh, well, this is obviously true. So I'm going to confession and I'm going to be Catholic again. Now, there was lots of reading that had to follow, and there's lots of reasons, I think, looking back, why I was able to make that switch so fast. Um, you know, there's so many obstacles to conversion. Right. Uh, the first one is just embedded situations in our life for sin. So if you're divorced and remarried, there's that question, oh, do I, I have to get an annulment? Oh. And how, what kind of situation is that going to put up? If you're living with your boyfriend and using contraception, like, oh, I'm really going to have to change my life if I... If I say this is true, I don't want to change my life. And so that's an obstacle to conversion. And then there's obstacles to conversion like C.S. Lewis. You know, he was an Ulster Protestant. Yeah. <laughs> Anti-Catholicism was so deeply ingrained in him. And even though his theology became more and more Catholic throughout his life, he just couldn't get past the anti-Catholicism of his youth. Right. I didn't have any of those obstacles. You know, I wasn't divorced and remarried. I wasn't living with my boyfriend. <laughs> I... I didn't have any great ingrained prejudice against the church, and my family certainly wanted me to stop being an evangelical and come back home. They didn't fully understand what they meant, what that meant, you know, because they still didn't fully grasp the faith. They were still struggling in their own ways, but they wanted me to become Catholic. So it was very easy for me to make that decision. So I made it without even fully understanding, you know, why I had done it. Probably the primary reason was, you know, I, I knew Jesus was real. Like, I loved Jesus. I had spent years following Jesus. We had a relationship. I talked with him like he was, sometimes I think he probably would have liked me to be quiet. Uh, <laughs> so I had this deep sense of love for Jesus. There was no question about that. But Rob raised the question, well, and what I had said earlier, you know, how, how do you know about Jesus? How do you... Yeah know that what he said is true. And I was like, well, the Bible. And he was like, well, where do you think the Bible came from? And I'm like, well, the apostles wrote it. And he's like, well, who transcribed it? Who kept transcribing it? Who translated? Who handed it down? Who preserved it from the vandal hordes, you know, when they were charging the mm -hmm. gates? And I was like, oh, a good question. <laughs> Obviously, the answer was the Catholic Church. So logically speaking, looking at the question, I was like, well, if the church was going to all this trouble to hand write it out page by page and protecting it and handing it down, why would they be doing that if there was all sorts of stuff in the Bible that contradicted them? I mean, they would be leaving that out, surely, <laughs> or they wouldn't, they'd be burning the Bible and be like, no, no, we have the authority. Don't, you don't need the Bible. But they didn't. You know, it was sacred. They took that responsibility of transmitting every word faithfully. So I was like, oh, well, and obviously, if I'm not, if I think something I'm reading in the Bible contradicts what the church is saying, then I'm reading it wrong. <laughs> so they have to know more about this than I do. So that was the primary, that when, once that was decided, you know, as a 19 year old, I had decided who Jesus was, you know, he was Lord, liar, or lunatic, and I decided he was Lord. So now as a 25 year old, I needed to decide who the church was, you know, was she some harlot or was she the bride of Christ? And the only logical conclusion I could come up with that she was the bride of Christ. So after that, it was up for me to learn the rest. <laughs> and, uh, Why don't we pause, yeah. take a break there, because okay. I have some questions about the rest that you had to pick up Great. on, as well as it, it, what stuck out with me in your, as you're telling your story, was that when your friends wanted you to do the Lord's Supper, you knew that, you, you believed that it really was the body and blood of our Lord, a seed was planted there, and you knew you guys couldn't do that. Yeah. I want to talk about that when we get back, the reality of, of that seed that was in you that grew later as you came back. So we'll pause right there. We'll come back in just a moment with more from Emily Stimson Chapman. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest tonight is Emily Stimson Chapman. She's a, 
uh, author of several books. We'll talk a little bit about the Catholic table. I hope we have time for that. I think we will. She also wrote these beautiful bones, these right? Beautiful bones. Okay. And also the Catholic Girl Survival Guide for the Single Years. I didn't read that one. No, you didn't? <laughs> oh, we should get you a copy. It's pink. It would look lovely on your shelf. <laughs> um, but um, your the second book I mentioned uh, is your your book on the on uh, the theology yes. of the body. So we might mention that too, because that had something to do with your journey too. In fact, let's pick up where we I broke you off there, uh, because you want to talk about a couple other topics. You're back in the church, and you said that it was surprisingly easy, so easy. because you didn't have these huge barriers like C.S. Lewis and others had, because. In many ways, those journeys, like C.S. Lewis, if he were able to come in, would be a, a major sign of grace to break through huge right. barriers. They're all sign of grace, able to put away those difficult things. Well, that's all the work of grace giving you strength. But in some sense, grace worked differently in you. You didn't have all those things, but you must have had a few. Well, for me, Theologically, was, I'm thinking. Yeah, for me, it was like I said, it was a question of authority. Yeah. So that was the primary thing. Does the church have the authority to interpret scripture does what the church write in her encyclicals and her apostolic, you know, letters, is that, is that an authentic interpretation of scripture? Does she have the authority to bind and loose? As soon as I decided that the church did indeed have the authority to bind and loose, then <laughs> I was the problem if I didn't understand something. So if I didn't understand why the church talked about Mary the way she did, if I didn't understand why you had to go to mass every Sunday, if I didn't understand those things, the fault was in me and I needed to bring my mind into conformity with the church. Mm. So I thought about St. Paul and you know, you'll be transformed by the renewing of, the renewal of your mind. Mm. And I realized that's what hap needed to happen to me. My mind had been shaped by the secular world in which I'd grown up and it had been shaped by the wonderful Protestants who had brought me so far in the journey but couldn't take me any further. And so then in typical Emily fashion, uh, this, I spent the entire month of January 2001 reading the catechism cover to cover. So that's what I did. I said, well, I was not given the faith as a child, so I need to learn the faith now. And there's this great big book of it. So <laughs> right, right. I'm going to sit down and read the catechism. And that's what I did from January to probably February, which was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, next book I read, so Rob, of course, is still in the background, and he's like, oh, look, I got a ripe one here. She's taking every book I can throw at her. So Frank Sheed's Theology and Sanity was the next book I read after the Catechism, and that was the most fantastic book because it gave me a Christology. It helped me understand Trinitarian theology. It helped me understand um, the whole theology of the church, you know, what we would say is ecclesiology. And even to this day, I can get all of my questions about Jesus's, you know, is he a human person or a divine person? I can get those right thanks to Frank Sheed. I often say he gave me the, the grammar of Catholicism. You know, if yeah. Catholicism were a sentence you could diagram, he taught me how to do that. And that was really foundational. Uh, Chesterton did the same, but he gave me the poetry of Catholicism. He showed me the beauty and the enchantment in the world. And I responded to it so quickly because that's what made sense to me. Uh, my Protestant reading had said, the world is a horrible fallen place. It's completely corrupted by sin, you know, bad, bad, bad. And I'm looking at the world around me and I was like, but look at that sunset. Like, does that not say God is glorious? Look at the mountain. It says God is, you know, God is not moving. Look at the ocean. It says God is infinite. I'm like, this whole world, there's beauty in it. There's, it's an enchanted world, even though there's sin in it. And G.K. Chesterton said that in a much more beautiful way than I could. So reading Chesterton, I just relearned the poetry of Catholicism. Learned it for the first time in many ways because I hadn't been given it as a child. One of the hardest things I think to try and explain to our evangelical brothers and sisters <clears throat> is that that wonderful fellowship that you were part of was all about a deep intellectual surrender to Jesus Christ mm -hmm. as Lord, Savior. Then you become his disciple, which often mean imitating him, of course. Again, intellectual, intellect and will, and then sharing that with those around you, intellect and will. The Catholic understanding of our walk with Christ is a completely changed person. Mm -hmm. It's different, it, it's more. You know, it's this idea that when we're baptized, we're new creatures, we're a part of the body of Christ. Uh, we, we're on the path of, this is a difficult word for evangelicals to understand, divinization. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole change of us. 
explain that or how you came to understand that in your journey, right. that well, aspect of it. I think what, what was the most helpful for me was John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Okay. So in, I came back to the church at the very end of the Jubilee year of 2000. So I think I got into like the tail end of graces of the Jubilee year. Uh, in March of 2001, I walk into a Catholic bookstore, a wonderful Catholic bookstore near um, Catholic University of America that closed a couple of years ago because all the good bookstores were closing. Um, and there was a whole pile of John Paul II books there. And one of them was the, the old Paula sisters edition of, of the Theology of the Body. I'd never heard of it before. This was before Christopher West to become a national yep. phenomenon. You know, I had no idea what this was. All I knew is that I was still trying to recover from an eating disorder. And there's this book by the Pope about the body. I'm like, well, I've got issues with my body, so I probably need to read what he says about the body. <laughs> and I picked up and I read it cover to cover. You know, what new Catholic doesn't pick up the theology of the body and read it cover to cover? And it was transformative for me because it put together all of the pieces in the books I had been reading, the, the Tom Howard, the C.S. Lewis, um, because there was lots of good stuff in C.S. Lewis, even as a Catholic, um, the uh, G.K. Chesterton. It was the sacramental worldview. It was a world, he helped me see that everything in creation speaks about God. Everything images God. And the body images God. You know, we don't just image God as rational creatures who are capable of loving and choosing right from wrong. Like our bodies actually speak something about God. Our bodies as male and female. And that was profoundly revolutionary for me to see that like these hands, like they allow me to love as God wants me to love. Yeah. Like there's something in looking at you, I see something of God that I'm not gonna see in any other human being on earth. When you look at me, you're gonna see something of God you're not gonna see in any other human being on earth. And this body that I've been trying to control, that I, you know, I hated, I wanted to erase it, was more than just a temple of the Holy Spirit. It was the image of God. And I switched in a moment from realizing, my body isn't something I'm supposed to control. It's supposed to, I'm something I'm supposed to care for. Mm -hmm. It is this great gift, you know. And I saw the beauty of the feminine body, of my feminine body, in a way that I had never seen it before. And that enchanted the rest, re-enchanted the rest of the world for me. Uh -huh. uh, just looking everywhere and saying, oh, God is, you see God in everything. Everything in creation yeah. is teaching me about him. Everything I do should be teaching people about God, the way I work, the way I garden, the way I cook. Like my whole life should be an expression of the fact that I am an image of God and that's going to come out in everything I do. So that was a that was a huge shift for me. How does our creator communicate with his creatures simplicity? How does our creator communicate to his creatures the concept of simplicity and detail. How does he do that? Well, how did Jesus do, do that? Well, let's look at the birds. Mm -hmm. He looks at, he, yep. so in other words, it's not just that he had an example, but he created an example mm -hmm. to demonstrate to us dumb humans what simplicity is. To discover simplicity, we look at his dumb creatures. No. You know, that's the expression of his love for us and the simplicity that he puts in the world for us to see. No, and just the seasons. There's yeah, everywhere yeah. you look, there's something that teaches us a truth about God. And so the world, instead of being this place that was just irredeemably fallen, became graced yeah. in my mind. It always was graced. And that's why I say becoming, returning to the church just helped me see reality. It taught me to see things correctly. I was seeing the world through a Catholic lens, through this lens that says the world is grace. Was your anorexia kind of a, an expression of a Gnostic understanding of yourself? I mean, had, it, I mean yeah. had you, at that time, before you came back to the church and even before your commitment to evangelicalism, were you seeing yourself as trapped in this unnecessary body and that the real you, as you went down to zero? Yeah, that's very much it. It was, my body was a prison. My body was, it was like a, carrying case for my iPhone. You know, it was something yeah. that could be discarded, it could be transformed, it could be, uh, we see that all the time. We can mark up our bodies however we want. We can give our bodies away to whoever we want. We can do whatever we want with our bodies and it doesn't affect us. We can still be good people. We forget that there's this connection between the body and the soul. I didn't see that 
connection I should have because it was obviously a struggle in my soul that was leading me to take it out of my body. But I had a very dualist approach. My body is one thing, my soul is another. Mm -hmm. And recognizing, as John Paul II says, that the body expresses the person. You know, the body, you don't have a body, but you are a body. Like my body is me, your body is you. That union that the Catholic Church teaches, I, I had never known that before and as I, that changed how I saw it. It made my body a precious gift that I needed to care for and treasure. Um, the Eucharist also helped tremendously. So that's another whole conversation. Yeah, well, when the, uh, the uh, apostles uh, said to Jesus, show us the Father, well, he's spirit. I show us the Father. He said, look at me. Yeah. We looked at the reality of, 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 of Jesus, uh, human and God together, his body that he took to show us God, which we can't see. We can't ever, as in the Old Testament emphasized, you can never see God. He showed us yeah. in his body. He brought it together. Um, the other thing that, that uh, fascinated me earlier, you had said, as you were an evangelical committed Christian, <clears throat> And your, your good, well-meaning friend says, oh, let's have Lord's Supper here at, for next Bible study. <clears throat> and something inside said, you can't do that. Talk about that. I mean, that's a seed that had been planted. Right, because if you had asked me at that moment in time, you know, is Jesus Christ fully present in the Eucharist? You know, blood, blood soul, and divinity. I would have said, well, no. But in the next breath, he said, well, then why can't we do it here? I said, but you just can't, you know? <laughs> like there was something deep down inside, even though I couldn't articulate it, that I knew the Eucharist was holy. And I knew that it was a gift of grace and that a bunch of people just couldn't, you know, conjure it up in the middle of a Bible study. There was something sacred about it. I knew that what they were proposing was a sacrilege, even though I couldn't have given you that language. And I do think that was, yeah. you know, deep down inside, even if the catechesis I was given as a child was inadequate, we still knelt when the priest consecrated the Eucharist. Um, my body was teaching me things like this is a, this is serious business. We are kneeling <laughs> down right now. <laughs> uh, people are bowing their heads. There's bells ringing. Serious business. Um, and you can I couldn't let go of that. I couldn't yeah. forget that. Intellectually, I might not have agreed with that, but that sense of belief and reverence had worked its way into me in a way that I hadn't realized. Yeah, and it, it isn't, I'm guessing, it isn't just intellectual that you had had this information you picked up along the way, that there's grace there that's awakening yeah. you to the reality of the sacramental beautiful gift that we have. Right, well, I've been baptized. I had the graces of my baptism in me, and I had my guardian angel, who I'm yep. sure was you know, doing backflips as I started reading more about Catholicism. So I just, I, I know that God was working. God used my one, you know, those wonderful Protestant friends of mine in so many ways. I was protected from sins I might have committed otherwise. I was given guidance that I would not have had. Um, I'm so grateful for that part of the journey. But I also know he was working through that to bring me yeah. home to the Catholic Church. That whole time, that was the trajectory I was on, even right down to the love for C.S. Lewis. You talked about that uh, group of wonderful Christian brothers and sisters, but you didn't want to talk about certain subjects because it would be divisive. I don't want to talk about it, it would be divisive. So pretty soon that list of things becoming divisive probably gets longer and longer because you don't want to uh, uh, um, offend somebody do we enable people who have these eating disorders because we don't want to be divisive, we don't want to be, you know, we don't want to hurt their feelings. And so uh, did, were you allowed to continue on that journey, sadly, because people were afraid to talk to you about it? No, but they weren't able to give me a language for understanding why I needed mm. to be feeding myself, why it was important to value myself. Um, you know, I was frustrated because God became incarnate. You know, the Word became flesh so that we could know Him and love Him and right. figure out what the heck He'd been doing in salvation history for the past 5,000 or so years. Um, and I was frustrated with the fellowship because I was like, but our faith has to become incarnate 
in our daily lives. Like you can't just say love Jesus. Well, how do I love Jesus? You can't just say hold each other accountable. What are we holding each other accountable to? <laughs> right, right. Like, so I loved doctrine as soon as I started discovering the beauty of doctrine. I'm like, all right, this is how I do it. This is how I love Jesus. This is how I love him in these different ways. The Eucharist was different. The Eucharist was the doctrine for me that was healing. And that's why Protestant friends didn't have. Mm. Um, the same month I discovered the theology of the body, March 2001 was a big month for me. <laughs> I was walking back from my pew at Holy Communion at St. Joseph's Church on Capitol Hill, and a thought occurred to me. I knew, I knew, because I read it in the Catechism, the Eucharist is, you know, the real presence of Christ. But as I'm walking back to my pew, I have the thought, the most intimate communion I have with God is that I eat him. Like, God becomes food for me. Like he gives himself to me, body to body, flesh to flesh. And that turned my world upside down. That was the language my Protestant friends didn't have. Uh -huh. So suddenly I see that God becomes food and all food in some way points us towards the Eucharist. And that's, you know, what I really talk about in the Catholic table where, you know, food nourishes us and strengthens us and, you know, comforts us, it brings us together into a community. And that's what the Eucharist does. <laughs> like the Eucharist, you know, nourishes us with God's life and strengthens us with his spirit. And it draws us and builds us into this community of, of believers, the body of Christ. And I started seeing that just as the sunset spoke of God's beauty and the mountains spoke of God's strength, food spoke of God's nourishing love in the Eucharist. And that transformed my fear of food into awe. And my goal became to always eat Eucharistically. So always gratefully, always joyfully, you know, always as much as possible with others. So. Yeah, I was trying to find real quickly here. Uh, we need to take a break in the program so I can find this, but no, I'm joking. <laughs> but um, it talks in the book of Acts about the disciples getting together and uh, they had had uh, a, a conversion somewhere and they're gathering to eat and drink. They're gathering for a meal. And I remember as a Protestant just thinking, well, they're, having, they're, they're getting together. It never crossed my mind mm -hmm. that, that the specific expression of the fact that they were sharing bread and, and it was the Eucharist, though they weren't using that phrase. It's all the way through the, the scriptures. But if we're not looking for it, we don't see it. We can, we can miss right. it. Right, no, and when you start actually looking at how food is talked about in sacred scripture, it's amazing. And I've been studying this for years, but then I had to write a whole chapter on it. So right. I was like, there was even more than there was. <laughs> so all of food throughout sacred scripture is being, is setting us up to understand the Eucharist. And then you have Jesus at Emmaus Road and you know, Jesus right. is known to them in the breaking of the bread. That's, that's the Eucharist. <laughs> like it's not like yeah. they're just having a meal together, but at the same time, having a meal together is an experience. It's a foretaste of the communion that we have in the body of Christ. So they both work together and there's a, yeah, there was just this richness yeah. and beauty in the whole of the Catholic life experience that I hadn't been given as a Protestant. Let's take this email because it connects mm -hmm. with what you've just been talking about in your book. Uh, it comes from Bobby from New Mexico. As a Catholic, I know that Jesus gave himself to us in the Eucharist as the bread of life. How should this influence our understanding of food in the Christian life? Oh, it should understand in every <laughs> possible way. I love that question. Uh, well, for me, it became, I had to stop denying myself food. I had to stop using food as a weapon because food is a gift. Food is a yeah. gift from God. It is something that's meant to help us understand the Eucharist. It's meant to help us have energy so we can do the loving and serving he wants us to do. So I talk a lot about that in the book, but when I said eating Eucharistically, so Eucharistia in Greek means Thanksgiving. So we should always be eating with Thanksgiving. We should be grateful to God for supplying us with the ingredients. We should be grateful to the person who's cooked it um, joyfully. You know, God calls us to receive his body with joy. And so to eat happily, like, when it's a feast day, have that piece of cheesecake, you know, <laughs> live a little, like put your, put the butter on the vegetables. There's so much joy in all of these things. Um, also just charitably. So when, the Eucharist is the ultimate sign of God's love for us. It's this radical, extravagant, generous love. And if you were to come to my house for dinner 
I would be putting my love for you into the meal I served, you know? So every money, every dollar I spent on the meal, everything I did in preparing it, that's a way of saying I'm honoring you. You are worth this effort. You are worth my time. And so to receive that gift from others, not to be like, oh, well, you know, I don't eat olives, sorry. Um, I'm fasting today. I can't eat the meal that you prepared for me. But just to, as long as it's not going to kill you, peanuts will kill me. So, you know, generally it's not charitable for me to eat peanuts when, you So you, you don't know, do a thank you helping of uh, Yeah, of peanuts. I figure me dropping dead at your dinner party is not the most loving thing to do. So obviously there's, there's room for that. Something crossed my mind, because I want to make sure we get this question yeah. in. Uh, in terms of the anorexia, because I think maybe to make sure you talk a little bit about that. It, it wasn't merely that, oh, you got a new idea about it and it cured you. Right. Because it, it's it's difficult for a lot of people that are dealing with that. It, It's both and. I was given an extraordinary grace. Uh, so the very grace that made my conversion so easy, God really did with two thoughts. The food is the most the most intimate communion I have with God is that I eat Him, and I'm called to con care for my body, not control it. Those two thoughts were incredible moments of grace for me. Um, they did what no number of years of counseling could do. But then I still had to learn to live it out in practice, and that took a few yeah. years. That took me figuring out. You had to out, accept that person in the mirror. I had to accept the person in the mirror, and I had to learn what my body needed. I'd spent yeah. so many years denying it food, eating when, you know, not eating when I was hungry, eating when I wasn't hungry, not sure what was the right amount. And it took a few years for me to figure out like, okay, this is what my body needs to be full. This is what my body, this is how often I should eat. No, you don't need to have that, you know, I didn't know like how many cookies do I get? I never thought I could have any. And then I go to Steubenville, my roommate's having four or five cookies. I'm like, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you actually eat four or five cookies. So it was a process for me that took several years. Um, the intellectual work really was accomplished very quickly. Like God yeah. gave me a great grace, and I know it was a great grace. And, you know, I'm so grateful, incredibly grateful for that. And then I had to learn how to live in that grace, and that took a number of years. All right. Let's try and get one more email in. Samantha from New Orleans writes, the feminine genius is such an interesting way to think about the dignity of womanhood and the unique call each of us has as a woman to particularly embrace who we are as made in God's image. What might be a few specific ways Catholic women can better understand our uniqueness in God's plan of creation? And also how can we better serve the world with our feminine gifts and talents. Thank you, Samantha. That's a great question. Um, I have a, a chapter on that in these beautiful bones. So, okay. <laughs> uh, no, I love writing about the feminine <clears throat> genius. You know, John Paul II talks about how, well, when we go back to the body expresses the person, and what is the woman's body made for? You know, it's made for motherhood. It's made to nurse a baby. It's made to grow a baby. It's soft so that it can comfort a baby. That doesn't mean that every woman is going to be a mother. I am not a mother. I would like to be, <laughs> but my husband and I are not, have not been blessed with children as of yet. Um, but that doesn't mean that my body is speaking a lie. My body is still revealing something very important about who I am. And so what it's revealing is the call to spiritual motherhood. And every woman in the world, whether she has 20 children or no children, whether she's a lay woman, whether she's a religious sister, we're called to love people with a mother's love. And that is doing the same things in spirit that a mother's body does. So we nourish people. We see the beauty in them. You know, it's a, a mother's love is a nourishing, nurturing love that says, I see what's important in you and what's good in you, and I'm gonna help bring that out. And women can do that regardless of what number of children we have. Uh, one of the most beautiful statements in scripture is John uh, the Baptist statement, he must increase and I must decrease. Talk about the, the sense of humility from the perspective of- Of the feminine genius. Yes. Well, it's very easy in our culture to get caught up in thinking, it's all about me. It's me that has to get ahead. I need to get the attention. I need to get the affirmation. I need to make sure that I'm at the front of the line. But mothers don't do that. You know, mothers sacrifice themselves for their children. Mothers make sure that all their little, ch you know, ch ch little kidlings are ahead of themselves in line. You're not leaving anyone behind. So having the humility to look out for those who are struggling, who are not necessarily going to be able to give us anything or do anything for us, but who we can give something to. 
to be willing to be the person in the background at times who is making sure that you know every person is being loved the way God wants them to be loved. Even if it's just remembering to get a card for the person at work whose mother died, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that's an act of the feminine genius. That's an act of humility. It's a selflessness. It's thinking about another person before you're thinking about yourself. Yeah. And, and the humility of beauty is difficult. That people who are gifted with beauty often don't recognize it as a gift. And it could be a handicap. Mm -hmm. It could be the very thing that prevents them from being all that God wants them to be, when in fact it was a gift to be utilized as a channel of grace towards other people. Emily, what's your, the, the Catholic table? Dot com. Dot com. Yeah. That's the name of the book as well as the website. So God bless you in that. Thank and, you. And all your work and your, how long have you been married? Uh, 11 months next week. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Emily's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.